Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invite to, to the Moodle Symposium. Uh, I'm relatively new to the country. I arrived uh, over just a year ago to Australia, so I'm still learning a lot about the different networks, the different events that exist. So I'm actually very privileged to be invited over here today. Just quickly about my, my background. I'm, I'm Greek, so I'm going to give you some time to tune into my accent. That hasn't changed a lot. Uh, I spent, uh, well, pretty much the majority of my years in Greece. I studied there my first degree in uh, philosophy and pedagogy. Hence, the topic today is a mixture between philosophy, education, and technology as a combination. And then I moved to the UK where I spent uh, the majority of my time studying as a master's student, as a PhD student. And then I, I spent the very first three years of my professional career. Moved a bit to New Zealand, then to Hong Kong, and now in the last year I'm in um, Macquarie University in the Center for Learning and Teaching. Now, uh, I've been enjoying the conference so far, a lot of nice presentations, a lot of stimulating discussions. Interesting from my point of view also to see the different discourses and vocabulary that people are using when it comes to address issues around technology and around education. And uh, I can take from the very first keynote speaker uh, the idea of flexible and personalized learning. I can imagine that the majority of you, you were there in the opening. There's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of interesting ideas, all the way to the very last presentation I, I went today, which was by uh, Associate Professor Kathy Ellis, who in a way she, she put directly the essence of education in question. All of these things that we are doing are fantastic. We are doing personalized learning. We are doing blended learning. We are promoting one way or another, but to what end? So I'm going to try to touch this what end today, and I'm going to play a bit with politics, so you will see from the beginning how my political position is actually uh, influenced the particular presentation. And I'm going to allow some time for questions. Now, I gave the title uh, Reconceptualizing Space, Time, and Practice, primarily because I believe whatever we do as human beings in a society, civilized or non-civilized, is about these three things. We all are, we are somewhere in a space at a particular time or for a particular time, and we do things, whether this is in our families, in our private time, in our schools, our universities, in the army, anything. It's around three main concepts. So that's the very first thing I want you to engage cognitively with me today, and perhaps question it from your own point of view, but also back to me in the discussion point. The second is this idea of education, which I consider to be tremendously important when it comes to universities. A lot of the presentations that we listen to when it comes to technology, they avoid the word education and they go directly to the idea of learning, which is very much useful term and very useful idea. But don't forget that whatever we do in higher education and in schools is part of education primarily. So quickly I'm gonna, being a philosopher myself, I'm gonna quickly just play a video for you. Just pay, spend a few minutes thinking about it. Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives chained deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves. And they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them a fire is burning. And between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day, a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals, and people carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. the shadows and the echoes of unseen objects. Now, imagine that the prisoner is released. After some time adjusting to the blinding light, the freed prisoner will begin to experience the world outside of the cave for the very first time and it is like nothing he could have ever imagined.
With his new perception of the world, the man will of course want to return to his friends to share his incredible discoveries. But the prisoners cannot recognize their old friend. He appears as all things do. His voice is a distorted echo, and his body is a grotesque shadow. They cannot understand his fantastic stories of the world outside of the cave. To them, it will never exist. This, of course, does not make the world outside of the cave any less real. Have you ever heard about the allegory of the, the cave? Okay, I mean, if you haven't and you have some time for philosophy, you have some time to spend reading, try at least to read some of the Platonic dialogues, especially the ones that they do address fundamentally the issue of existence and how do we come to know. Because I think as educators, it's, it's our own duty to understand at least how people come to know, to understand reality, before we attempt any type of design with or without technology. So from that point of view, just quickly to, to summarize, the allegory will say that the prisoners are all of us, once we arrive in this life, everything makes little sense and is part of a human society, of a civilized society, to start to give form to whatever is not known. That's why Plato will say in the Republic that we have education, which is different from learning. So my very first starting point today is that education, as opposed to any kind of other form of interaction, as I'm going to call it like that, in particular informal learning, is when someone, in our case ourselves, the Australian Defence College, Macquarie University, Canberra University, a system designs for particular interactions to happen and for particular learning to take place. Would you associate, would you agree with this kind of definition? It's something that you opened up for you for discussion within your own groups. Informal learning takes place as well on the side. We could perhaps influence it, but our primary scope is to make sure that good education takes place. And, that, and that's a very much starting point. Now, I'm going to talk about space, time, and practice in relation to education. And I'm going to just uh, try to confuse you with a couple of more notions, but I'm going to try to articulate them as simple as I can. I'm not claiming any expertise on the particular philosophy I'm going to talk about, but I'm fascinated by that. So Plato is one. You can go back and read. There's plenty of things to read. If you are interested in a design point of view, a very good philosopher to start your uh, kind of contact with is Martin Heidegger. When Martin Heidegger has tremendously influenced architects and designers, so a lot of the things that we've seen around in terms of the, the buildings are being constructed, the cities are being constructed, are being influenced by the work of this particular philosopher. He says some very simple things, though, that if we try to keep them in our mind when we talk about educational design, we can make our life easier, but I argue will make our communication with our audience, our students, our designers, our teachers easier. So he has a particular notion that is called the fourfold of being, and I'm going to talk to you about it very quickly. Published in a book called Poetry Language and Thought, he will pretty much argue that whoever we are, whoever the students are, they are part of a system. And this, this system comprises earth, sky, gods, and mortals. Can you see why? Is, is that four terms familiar to you? Yeah, just take one minute just to synchronize a bit of the vocabulary. He will argue, for example, that one of the major things that we do is that we occupy space, we occupy Earth, in particular case, and to a more kind of micro level, we occupy spaces that we have created, including a space like a university, a space like a city, a space like a church, like an army camp. All of them are our Earth for the particular time, for the particular practice. He will also say that we all have a notion of sky, and he will say that sky is time. So we, sky in a way with the moon and sun represents time. So we do things in different rhythms, in different tempos. So we do fast things, slow things, for a day, for a minute, for a second, for a week. So the idea of time that pretty much defines us and defines the way we set up 
our programs, our universities, our semesters, our terms is very much there and should be understood in combination with the place. He also said we have the gods, and the gods can be numerous. One of them could be your vice chancellor. <laughs> chancellor, not chancellor, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One of it could be the policy, Tesla. It can be anything that has a power to impose something in your space and in your time. Yeah, so don't ignore this particular parallelism. And at the end of the day, we have our mortals, who is ourselves, who have to deal with that, and our students. So he will argue, don't never try to isolate these things and talk only about space or only about time unless you try to understand what is the context. And the context comprises of these four main elements. In an online environment, for example, in Moodle, in the learning and management system, our Earth can be represented as the main space. So Moodle, as a, as a tool, can become our main Earth for the action that we're about to design there. In the same way, sky is the notion of time you create within Moodle, the type of activities, if you're going to allow an activity to run for an hour, for a week, for three weeks, for a semester, and so on. The guides, that could be your learning outcomes, the activities themselves, the readings, the things that you do, and then the mortals, the students that you have, whether they are students who are physically here and they just go in this space to do something on the side, if they are fully online, and so on. So I will argue keep this in your minds when you come to discuss. And if people come to tell you, why have you tried this technology, try to see it in relation to the totality of it. OK, so far? Another thing that Heidegger said, Heidegger, by the way, was against technology. He's an interesting philosopher. He wrote an essay, Question of Technology, in the 1950s, if I'm right. And he gave this metaphor. And he will say, imagine the River Rhine in Germany. Yeah? Flowing, that's a natural flow of a physical phenomenon. You have different options. You can have, do a different thing there. You could go and actually build a hydroelectric station in a way plug in a technology, something not belonging to the nature of the environment in order to transform it to something else. Or you could design things around the river Rhine like, for example, she will argue about the wooden bridge, that still is a piece of technology that provides some sort of uh, connection between the space, but does not interrupt the flow. She will go actually all the way down to say that from the time you're going to create the dam, you have already changed the essence of the river. The river is not anymore a river, could become a lake, it's a station, it's something else. So just to play with the devil's advocate, Anytime you hear this buzzword, transformation, transformative learning, let's change things, disruption, cha challenge it. What exactly do we aim to challenge? What exactly do we aim to change? If we have a very good practice in education that works, and by introducing technology, instead of creating a bridge for people to understanding, we actually take them out of the essence of learning that actually happens really well, you will double check it. And this is a very important message for me when it comes to complicated designs. When people tell me, why don't you plug in this? Why don't you do this type of assessment? And I say, well, this thing works. It's actually very much organically aligned with what we try to achieve within our system. So it's a very important notion for that. So it's a good metaphor, yeah? A bridge or a hydroelectric station. And pass it back to the learning technologies, to whoever actually challenges the way we do things. And I'm doing it myself. Second philosopher, I appreciate he's a Marxist philosopher, and extremely Marxist philosopher, <laughs> I have to say. Henry Lefebvre, The Production of Space, one of the best books you could do and read about space, if you're interested. He will argue that space is actually a social construction and influence very much what we do, and we influence how the space is. So it's a dynamic process. And she will say that the space is three things, perceived, conceived, and lived. At the perceived level, the space is nothing more than what we come to recognize as common sense. The university as a building. Okay? It's there. It's built for the purpose. Because of the way it's been built, allows people to navigate around it. It provides, has a cafe. It has a social space. It has trees. Some of them they don't. But in a way, creates particular habits for our students. 
Then he will say is the conceived space, and this is very much our job, educators, learning designers, uh, trainers, how then we can repurpose this particular space that we built there in order to allow the best experience for our people. So the conceived space is pretty much what we experience here. Yeah? It is a space, it's been conceived by the designer as a place where you're going to be sitting there and listening to an audience. The door, the, the room next door has a totally different conceived, still is a, is a room, has the walls and the things of the physicality, but everything else has been redesigned. And then he will say is the actual lived space, and this is where we fail a lot, observing. If, for example, I can see you all falling asleep in 20 minutes or 10 minutes because I'm getting too much into the philosophy, it's me to understand that the type of things I'm doing in this space is not working, and I should be doing the lived experience, repurpose, perhaps ask you to do something. So the lived experience is how do people come to experience the space. Now move this a bit over here, and this is the representation. These are all from Macquarie University. It's a very interesting campus. We have nice buildings. We have nice plants around it, big amphitheaters that they are conceived to be full of students. And by the way, yes, they are full of students. So the, the trilogy of the space in that way is spot on. I can imagine the same happens when you do your military training. You, if you want to send students to a particular simulation, it's being built for a particular case with X capacity and so on. If you're going to increase it, automatically you need to reconceptualize it. However, because he's Marxist, he will say that nothing goes without critique. And he will say all these things, they have to do with the human ability to consume, distribute, and produce. Okay, very Marxist idea. Quickly, I'm going to say something political, but I'm going to say it anyway. If, even the way that in neoliberal societies who have the tendency to create more and more bigger and bigger universities, in the same way we create bigger and bigger mega cities. If you are in China, you heard about the megalopolis. The idea behind the system is that we create spaces that they are so apart from this kind of idea of production, distribution, consumption. So the people who live one space, they only worry about consuming. They don't worry at all about the production or the distribution. And we leave production and distribution to other people, according to, to Marx, to the superpowers, to people who want to control us. Now, take this idea of production, distribution, and consumption of knowledge, and try to see how the spaces, the introduction of technologies, even the introduction of MOOCs, all these big things like MOOCs, they arrive out of non-agenda. They have a very political agenda there. MOOCs, in a way, they allow people to distribute and consume knowledge, but very few of the people who are taking it, they are part of the production of the knowledge. So that creates a totally different idea of education. Okay, so far? So it's highly political. You decide, do I want a space where I can co-create something with my students? They can learn, they can be part of it, or I'm creating a space and a place where people are going to just distribute or consume. It's a very important notion for us to decide. He also talks about the time in the same exact way, perceived, conceived, and, uh, and the live. The actual perceived time is our seconds, our minutes, the way that we society decided to divide time to make sense of our everyday practice. But then, as an academic or as a designer, you make judgments of how particular time should be consumed for a particular activity. So a training, for example, in a simulation, may, you may decide to last up to an hour because this is sufficient enough to complete the learning of the skill. But if you're going to have a problem solving or a thinking exercise and people then need to go out to different spaces, you expand this over to a week or two weeks. And this is where online learning becomes interesting. You can actually allow these things to happen. And finally, though, is the personal perception of the students themselves, their personal rhythms. I set it up for a week, but actually did it happen over a week, or at the end of the day, everything happened Friday afternoon before the submission deadline. And this is where you as academics, you try to design the activities in a way that makes real sense. I myself use a lot of online discussion for, I teach a lot online, and I allow them two weeks, hoping that they will use these two weeks of time to develop an argument. In reality, I find out that they also pick their own particular moments to contribute. So if I go to redesign my online activity out of experience, I will say, well, this activity only generated an hour of effort. Why don't we actually compress it a bit? 
So these are all decisions, but you need to have this notional idea to, to look for this evidence. And this is where analytics are good. Okay, so far all tune in. I don't see anyone falling asleep, which is good. Now, a very quick example, yeah? This is all from my own units. The, very, the top one on the top of the key responsibilities is an empty Moodle space, sandbox. It's my earth as a designer, and I can start designing things. I teach a group of students at the postgraduate level, fully online, using discussion fora a lot, to the level that perhaps they feel extremely like, OK, there must be something else we can be doing over there. But I try my luck. So I allow them, and I take the Moodle as it is on the beginning, and I create something that is so much sequential as it is the one on the bottom. So I tell them exactly how I want them to move in the space and how much time I expect them to spend. And this creates expectations and communicates to my students why this activity should be completed with this timeline. Yeah? And then I can play with it. Now, if I do that, and I'm going to use very quickly something from analytics, which is another area of me that I'm researching at the moment. As an as a academic, I play with three different types of time and space. I still use the online discussion forum. But in the very first example, I make myself very much visible in the space. So the God, myself, for the eyes of the students, is present. I give them very particular time frames and very particular questions. So they have very much all the parameters they need to know. As we move with the activities, I allow more and more flexibility to the students, hoping that they will start finding their own way around the space. I use a bit of social network analysis, manually, unfortunately, because I don't have the tool to do it. So myself, downloading things, mapping them against. And let's see what happens in this space, just to show you how important it is how we structure the activity. This is a network of students on a highly moderated online discussion network that actually I ran just last term. Yeah? In this case, you will see myself, if you can just spot in the middle, there's a T1, that's the teacher. I attracted a lot of attention. Me and S14, we are two of the key players in this space and time. Yeah? It's a confirmation to me that the activity that I designed, which is pretty much come and ask me questions because you need to learn, works. The second type of activity where I ask them themselves to find their way in the same group of students, same type, exactly the same students actually, moving differently. It's very interesting, this S6, 17, 5, they just have a follower. So as you expect in a space where you allow students to find their own networks, this is what they do. I'm not going to go and complain and I say, oh, you're not a big group there, guys, because it never happened. I have 17 students. They all found their own micro networks to keep working. And I pass this back to the students and I say, well, that, that works. For the type of activity we have, this works very well. But if I wanted you to all talk to each other, this is not working well. So I really need to go and adjust my design, my space, my time, how much I allow you to do. And this is when I just tell them, OK, no instructions at all. Here are a few articles and a few resources. You know, this kind of generic Moodle general discussion, which I hate, by the way, but it's always there when I see an online discussion, general discussion, as if everybody will start talking to each other out of, because they have plenty of time. And this is what happens. A number of them, they never participated. They are on the left. The big uh, guys who are actually the same, the loud people, this uh, 9 and 16, they managed to attract a lot of attention, and that's it. So what I'm trying to show here is very much important, the way you design the activity, the tool, and the time that you allow for the activity has a significant impact of how this network of learning might happen. I'm not going into the quality of learning at this stage. That's a totally different story. But at least in terms of me as a designer, I have a tool to look for particular patterns. It's very, very important to know this. Learning, academic, this is just a few. These are all slides by Professor Norma Jackson. If you don't know the name, write it down. Norma Jackson has written a lot on life-wide education from the United Kingdom, from Surrey. And she has a lot of interesting resources for lifelong learning. So it's a very good idea, and she provided me with these slides. These are just some of the spaces for academic learning. These are, as you can all agree, practice real-world spaces that happens. 
and part of us is we try to blend them. These are all or some of our digital spaces. So we don't lack space, we don't lack ideas, we don't lack technology. This is one of the key things. What perhaps we lack is trying to make sense of how we can repurpose all of these things for achieving a particular outcome. So now very quickly, I'm gonna go back to remind myself primarily, because I always do, but also to you, what at the end of the day is important. Is it important if I have Moodle, Blackboard, simulation, email, Facebook, or it's important whether my students, they will receive something in a meaningful way, whether they will explore something in a way that makes sense to them. Okay, these are just some of the ways where people activate, whether they will practice, whether they wanna create, whether they will meta-learn, and so on. So, a very quick summary so far, so I can continue with the second part. We are all surrounded by space. We all influence space, and space influences us. So, in that way, we are privileged. We don't need to argue, we don't need to disagree. The only thing we need is to think what we want to make of it, and if necessary, create new spaces. The second thing is we are all surrounded by time and our own lived times, how you as human beings behave in a social or in a personal environment, is not any different to what your students are doing in an overall, okay, there are a lot of, of, of generation issues and so on, but overall, we still wake up in the morning, the students, they go to the uni, you might go to work, you're gonna break to eat at the same time, and more likely we're all having some sort of sleep. Three hours, four hours, five hours, but there is a pattern in human behavior. You cannot actually disagree with that. The most important thing is how then we make sense of this time, when is the best time to meta-learn? When is the best time to create? And I'm gonna give you a quick example, because I was listening to the presentations around simulations. I was listening to some of the presentations around the notion of uh, mobile learning. They're all valuable ideas. But the sequence in which you will introduce any kind of these activities and spaces is very important. If you are, for example, to introduce a skill-based design in a course, and you're gonna try to introduce it at the very beginning, so you start your course with a simulation, you automatically create an expectation that you know, something will have to come out of it. So you do the simulation, and then perhaps you want to spend some time analyzing it, going, link it backwards to thinking what happened. It's a very particular sequential learning. You know, the simulation on its own it does not do the job in the same way that the reading on its own that don't, does not do the job. But you as a designer, you will decide either to go sequential, come online, here is the reading, do the quiz, you failed, do it again, you failed, do it again, you pass, tick. Now here is the video of me telling you well done and a couple of explanations. And now that you are ready about it, I can also have a competence-based activity, which is a simulation, to try out. And closes the loop around this learning. Once you provide, obviously, the feedback, and, well, Kathy was talking about actually closing the feedback and act on the feedback as well, which is an important element. A different scenario will be what? Let's have a discussion about the simulation before we, the, the, the topic of the simulation. Let's read, yeah? Let's do the simulation, and then let's do a quiz. This challenges the order of practice, explore, receive. They are doing all of this, but what order they are doing it will define pretty much at what space you will send them and how much time you will allow them. And that's pretty much your decision, the designers, the teachers, the students that have, unfortunately, unless you allow them, very little influence in terms of this kind of sequence. You might disagree, but that's how I, I find it the more I, I, I get to talk to academics. So, now that we know that we all learn pretty much following particular patterns, it comes to a question, and I'm taking also my time, to where does this leave us as designers? And as a designer, I'm not meaning necessarily the educational designer, as a teacher who designs one instance of one day of military training, of police training, of philosophy training. Where do we start? Well, believe me, we have plenty of books. So don't worry, books, ideas, 
thousands, if not millions of hits. Go online and look for online learning. You'll spend the rest of your life going through resources. Yeah, I have no doubt. And I published, if it's in the area, you might mark across my name. I can imagine all of you, you will have some sort of input there. I tend to choose books that are very much practical at this stage. I love pedagogy. I love philosophy. But when it comes to communicate to someone who is not in my discipline, I try, to make sim I try to make things simple. So here are just three books that I came across. I know the authors as well. They are good academics in their own remit. I mean, they, we have books of the type of 100 plus activities. Actually, Curtis Bong just published another book with another 100 plus activities. So we have 200 plus activities. Okay? So you don't lack stimulation. Just Google, say, I want something to start my day one of week one. You will find at least 20 but you have to locate it within your time space idea. Otherwise, it might not work because it worked for this particular context. Very important scholar, Diana Lorillard from the Knowledge Lab, University of London. If you are serious about design thinking and design learning, it's one of the scholars I would say invest time to read. Especially the Teaching as a Design Science is a book that provides very much patterns, but still is a book, yeah? Just ideas that came from very much uh, I'm not going to go into other politics, but very comes from a, from a context that works for a particular group of students and so on. And of course, we have Jill Salmon. She's, I think, now in the University of Western Australia. She has published in the area of activities. We're talking about small level, mi micro level. Not, we don't go to big pedagogy here and understanding. But if you are stuck for ideas on activities, again, you might get something useful. Now, myself, just one self-promotion here, <laughs> OK? That's part of my PhD when I finish it. 2008, I finish it. That was one of the publications that came out after long efforts to try to make it understood to the publisher. So I'm going to try now to make it understood within a minute here. My main area of the PhD was online tutoring, in particular how students interact between themselves and the space in environments like Moodle. I, we did a lot of analysis over four different universities in the United Kingdom, including students from non English background like myself. Ignore everything, but if you want to keep one, keep the middle start there with a significant learning event. After interviews with my own students, interviews with my the tutors that I had, what really matters to them was what can be, I'm going to use the word hook, what is the main thing, like the key area that they need to concentrate their attention. And I call this significant learning events. So you might have a model full of videos, audio, simulation, and so on, unless yourself and the students, they know what exactly is the significant event that they need to concentrate, whether it is ethical decision for the particular thing in the army, whether it is a particular outcome, it's very difficult to be diverted and out of focus and disinterest. So all the efforts I would claim in that kind of diagram it should be concentrating to reminding the students of the significant event and organizing our resources and our Moodle pages and our online simulations in a way that they bring this back to the memory of the students. Because assessment will take over. From day one, they will keep asking, and will it be assessed? And you say, yes, because that's significant. I will question this. This idea is there. But there's three different ways for you to go around the idea, by video, by audio, by reading, by simulation. So find your way, but this is the essence of it. But also, I allow some sort of element of negotiation. And the negotiation I put over there came as a result of my own students. If I'm one week, two weeks down my teaching online, and my students are not engaging, I'm going to just say, oh, sorry, guys, next year. Or will you go back and say, is there anything we can do to help you? Is it a matter, perhaps, that I didn't include something in the resources that is useful to you? Someone was talking about um, resources. I don't know if you, 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 maybe you were talking about resources from a different university. That makes no sense. Um, it was actually a, a nice story that uh, Kathy Ellis told us about the future. But one of the key elements I got from that presentation was students working with examples that make little sense to them. Okay? So if I teach philosophy in an audience here and I keep referring to publishers and authors and people they never heard, 
and I know that next door in Sydney University someone published an interesting piece of work, why am I going to use this resource? Make it topical. But this could become part of your negotiation. Who are your students? If you have 98% Chinese students or Southeastern students, why don't you change a bit your design to meet the needs of the students? It's not going to take you long, but it's part of this negotiation. Now, a couple of examples. Greek project, three years, called the Dialogue Project, using Moodle 100%. 76 academics, sorry, teachers, primary and secondary teachers, with a number of academics working fully online in an environment like Moodle. They never seen each other apart from some uh, block delivery courses that happen across the country. I don't know if you know the geography of Greece. I'm, I can imagine the military definitely know it <laughs> because they study all the maps. It is a very much diverse country. You know, islands, people that don't have the ability to travel. It is actually a, a, a country that needs a lot of distance education. But in this project, I was responsible for the design of the model space. And the order, if you want my God at that point, told me, you have to design something that's going to be sustainable and keep people engaging for at least three years. Because the aim of the project is to develop learning designs for teachers across the country. We thought a lot how we're going to go about and doing it. And a lot of ideas came. One design was, why don't we go there and say, all the governmental documents on the top, all the school documents over there, all the discussion over there, all the assessment over there. Yeah, very structural, almost like a resource. So if we, if we are going down the route of designing Moodle as here is the resources, this is where you talk, and this is where you be assessed, my feeling was that we would be failing. These guys, they wanted a space for interaction. So we redesigned the whole thing in order to meet their own uh, learning, and we try to include elements of collaboration. So a lot of social tools, so actually they can link to each other, a number of online discussions at different stages. Imagine a teacher coming in the online space, getting something out, going in the class, trying it. Is a gap. They try it. Am I allow a space for them to come and discuss it back to us? I will argue yes, and we did it. So a lot of the teachers, they went out and they practiced something. Out of frustration, they want to come and tell us it didn't work. But unless I activate a space on Moodle to do it, it will be a missed opportunity. Make sense how the same thing can provide totally different learning experience over there. School of Education, that's I'm at, I'm at quarry, the course I'm teaching. The left is uh, content, the right is also content. It's exactly the same content. The very first one is a piece of written text that the students they can get. Once they were exposed, actually, let me see if I can go quickly on uh, the space. OK? So that's Moodle. I had the choice of creating here PDFs so students can download and read, or I design, if you go on conceptually, a book for them. So I try to put in order the learning that they're supposed to be doing in, an, in a book. And anything had to do with audio or videos, I try to put them here almost like a narrative. That's another important thing. Keep a narrative of learning. You tell a story to your students. And if you tell a story, anything can help you make clear the story. In my case, I was talking about, for example, tutorials. I was talking about uh, ICT in schools. As I was narrating for the students, I was embedding the videos. My other choice will be, here is my thinking. The videos, they all sit in a different, um, let's say, a different kind of resource bank. Just click and watch them without actually knowing why you watch them. So try to connect the space with the real actually activity. It makes a lot of sense. And the students actually quite like the idea. And they said, some of them, they said, it's the first time actually someone gave us a sequence that actually we've been studying a topic, not only isolated resources. And it was nothing more than repurposing the space I had available. I can imagine, for example, in the Army, if you're going to do uh, a role play or a simulation, not using the electronic formats, but Moodle, you might want to give different cases on the left. Each case has its complete resources, arguments, adds on and is self-contained. So once they get that, they get the concept. 
they don't go out of five different navigation tools to find them. Everything is self-contained, so they can feel empowered that they complete, they achieve something. It's very important in this kind of case. Going back a bit to show you a few more examples. Oops, that's not the one. Another example, that's also from uh, Macquarie with the support of uh, our own educational development team over there. They are doing a lot of fantastic work, including some work with uh, 3D imaging and 3D printing. It's another interesting idea of how you can repurpose space. Traditionally, the students in this group of archaeology, they will go into the Moodle space, and they will get what is on the right, an image of a piece of pottery. Yeah? The image in this particular space allowed one faction to see it. Okay? Students they will go, they will look at it, and they will say, now, that's the end of the story. I mean, what we want to do, to describe it, to do what? We start talking with academics, in particular the educational development team through a process that we have in the university, the faculty projects, and they start thinking, how can we enhance their ability? And they came with a 3D version of the same object, which allows at least the ability for students to rotate. So imagine the same picture coming there, and they can be able to rotate and explore it. It adds this extra element of exploration to the previous element which is just receive. Yeah? Think about it. it. It's not costly. It's just the idea what I'm going to do with that. You can even go into production, create something. This is a 3D printer. It's going to become cheaper and cheaper. All the literature we read about it is that they're going to be domesticating very soon people that can afford to have this kind of stuff. Imagine actually your students being able, I can go back to the army because I appreciate we are in a, in a military uh, college here. They, perhaps they, should, they could be able to print something and they can handle something, even in plastic, but a piece of weapon or a machinery that they should at least see it before they see it in action. It's an extra version from just looking at it in a video or in a, in a, in a case. So don't assume that these technologies are not there. They are here and they are moving a lot. That's an example from health science, yeah? I have no reason to believe why n any of us cannot do the same exactly thing on Moodle. It's nothing more than a case scenario, okay? It works like that. Imagine there's an outbreak in Bangladesh. The students, they go, they have what they have to do. They have a little preparation document that they can read. They can see a bit the geography. Actually, w the more I was looking at that, the more I was thinking of the army and training that can happen with all this interesting stuff that they're doing. They start, they pick a role, and then they move on. They can take a quiz. It's nothing more than an example of how all of it, the totality of content, discussion, activity, and assessment is embedded in one space. And this space is this online resource. You can do exactly the same using the lesson tool on Moodle if you know the sequence in which the events will take place. Here is the map. I'm going to make full of myself, but let's say here is the map of Afghanistan. These are the key areas where we need to be careful. Click here, assume a role that you want to play in this particular case, read the documentation or the instruction, engage with the role play. It's going to be cheap simulation, but still notional, conceived. They can do it. The same with medical doctors, with nurses, who everybody doing it. It's not actually so difficult. Uh, from current slides. I think I have one here from uh, training. This is from the US uh, basic scenario approach. Let's see if it's going to open. It's very much the same concept, same tools, which is nothing more than uh, training on ethics, how do you approach if you actually want to approach a particular um, or you meet uh, a particular person. And they go there and they can just keep going. There is a bit of video and audio embedded. I'm going to play it now. But he could just say, no thanks, I'm not thirsty. It's okay to be direct if you do it respectfully, and Haji Kamal will respect him for being honest. It would be more polite to say he's allergic and can't drink chai. Haji Kamal will know it's a white lie, and that's okay. They do it all the time here. But that would start the relationship out with a lie. Lieutenant Harrell would have to keep it up for his whole... 
Okay, it's, no, it's nothing sophisticated there apart from the scenario itself. And the technologies we have are already there. You can actually narrate these yourselves. You can record the voice and put them to images. So the space can actually can be expanded. You don't need the high cost simulations all the time. Talking about high cost, it can become low cost. If you are interested, there was a conference just a month ago in London, military learning and smart devices from the 21st to the 23rd. One of the biggest things they were talking is wearable devices. Okay? In the opening keynote today, we touched a bit about the idea. But uh, devices like Google Glasses, things like that, they will take the previous scenario, which is very much in the space of Moodle, and take it out to the open world. So keep your thinking in the designs in this kind of case. Final example, a one that goes a bit to the mobile learning and also a different way of space and time. Civil engineers at uh, Scottish University, they used to have two hours tutorial for 10 weeks every week looking on buildings that are about to collapse out of a photograph. The irony was that the building they were studying was about to collapse. Okay, so a unique opportunity to purpose the space you are in and make it a learning activity. So we talk to the particular academic and say, why do we give them this photograph from an American building? Look, there's a dump over there. There's no way. Why don't you turn this into a live lab for your students to investigate? And, you know, all the questions and how they're going to do it and where they're going to collect it. Well, a digital camera, a microphone, anyone? Yes, here it is. Take a photo put it on Moodle, write a couple of annotations as a very first thing. And we start engaging into a tutorial where he flipped all the two hours tutorials into living experiences, and he only called one face-to-face -face tutorial where he called a particular building investigation firm, like a group of professionals, to come and assess the outcome. Make it very much real world by saving 24 hours of misery of the students having to agonize over a photograph they couldn't really see, and having actually good fun and learning in action. Using technology only as a way to collect information, nothing more. The other learning actually was happening as we speak. Final thing, if you are struggle of anything to put these things in perspective, I came across as part of my work with uh, Scottish University, a framework called the Three Framework developed by professionals for professionals, and the main idea of the framework tries to put in order technology, space, time, outcomes. The framework very quickly says three things. Whatever you do as academics and whatever our students do, it is a progressive process. Always when we come across something new, we try to enhance it, to understand it, then we try to extend it, and then ideally, we should be empowered to practice it. Myself, when I learn to cook, I get my enhancement by observing other people how they do recipes. I practice it a bit by extending it and looking to my mom and doing, adding a couple of things. And at some point, I can figure myself I'm a good cook, empowered to go and do a meal for my, my wife or my, my friends. It's the same idea. A student who arrives at the military and there is a particular thing they need to understand the concept, you will extend it you will enhance it by giving them readings, quizzes, and so on. You will send them to do a little simulation to extend at least the basic skill, and at some point you will throw them out to the real world to empower them to practice it. Same in philosophy. So the, the, pretty much the, the framework argues, do your activities, you see your spaces, and try to put them in order so you are not putting the wrong activities for the wrong type of learners. Year one, day one students, throwing directly into the empowerment level, it might create a chaos that you have actually to manage. Why don't you go sequential? So it's a very interesting framework for you to do it. Just a couple of examples. If you are encouraging concepts, you may want at a very basic level in the space called wiki in that particular case, have students defining a couple of terms. Next year or the next type of activity, you may want to ask them to create a particular guide, Last one, they might want to do something else. I'm going to one that's very interesting, which is, for example, laboratory. That's something I come across a lot with biology people, medical, and so on. How can we use technology? Well, you can use technology. You don't need to use technology to simulate necessarily an operation, but having a video 
where you go through health and safety a lot of times, totally propagandistic and making sure that they cannot escape not doing that, works. Yeah? I mean, we brainwash them, but we know we're doing it for a good reason. And in the military, you are doing it. I can imagine when you are doing simulations as a pilot, you have to get it right. There's one way of doing things. There's no other. In that case, this technology works. But if you move then to exploration, you may open it up. And then once you throw them there, they can go and create their own reality. So these are all important things. Final thing, in my university, we just introduced a process called Design, Develop, Implement, which myself and uh, did receive from the educational development team we are leading. Our main purpose is everything I presented today, we put it down to our academics, and we work with them in terms of reconceptualize time, space, and practice for the type of learners they have. So we work with them, and through a process of visualizing how a learner will be from day one until graduation in this particular program is going to go. We scope it out totally in a visual map, and after that we work with a team of educational designers and other brilliant uh, team that we have over there to make it happen. It's a process that asks all the difficult questions to academics that they always avoid to, to, to ask about how can we do that, is it costly, and so on. To the question about cost, I have to say two things. Yes, it's costly, and yes, it's time consuming. But see it at least as two different things. One is fix, one is variable. Fixed time is the time you're going to put once. You're going to do it, and it's there. You can reuse it. Variable time is every time you use it based on the amount of students you have, it might expand. An online discussion with 10 people can cost me like one hour. With 120 students, it's going to cost me five hours. Do I, can I afford it? No. Out. Next. The next best. It's very simplistic in that way, but this is how it goes. Same with cost. Simulation, 10,000K. No. But we can achieve similar things for that particular by doing this and this and this. Or I can buy the simulation and I can get back training of 5,000 uh, people, which actually makes a good use of it. So always try to think of it as fixed and viable. So quick summary, time, space, practice define us. We live in an area with deregulation. I'm getting political again, but anyway. Deregulation is upon us, expressions of interest from external people, consultancies to come and help you sort out your lives is there. My view is get it right yourselves. You know your students. We know our spaces, even the spaces that they are a bit unique to us, we get to know them. Get the order right is the most important, and get actually things that are workable for your own context. And if we do that, I can imagine Moodle, Blackboard, anything can work. Thank you. <laughs>